Has there ever been a time in your life when you felt persecuted? Have you ever sought out a refuge from people who were trying to hurt you? Today we will speak about the Christian safe refuge. It is a spiritual refuge, but safer than any other refuge human beings may seek. It is a refuge obtained by faith in the divine promises. It has been experienced throughout all ages as being real and effective. Let us begin with Psalm 6, verse 2 to 4. All you who hear prayer, to you all men will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you atoned for our transgressions. To you, all men will come looking for refuge. All those who want to find refuge in God may find it through prayer, because God hears any prayer of faith. This may be understood only by those who have experienced the power of God in their lives. Blessed is he is the man you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. David didn't live in the temple, but he spoke of those who dwelt in the temple of God. He lived in that temple in a spiritual dimension. This implies having permanent access to God's temple. But he says, Blessed is the man who is permitted to come near, even physically, like the priest who at prescribed times could go into the inner rooms of the sanctuary. Another psalm of David. Answer me, O Lord, out of the goodness of your love. In your great mercy turn to me, do not hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Come near and rescue me. Redeem me because of my foes. Psalm 69, verses 16 to 18. David had been persecuted by Saul, the king of Israel, because that king knew that David had been chosen by God to replace him on the throne of Israel. If Saul reached David only once, David would be considered a dead man. David lived in anguish a great part of his life. He was the hero of more than 100 battles. Had he lost just one of these battles, it would have proved to be fatal. But God kept David's arm strong. David prayed to God, and the Lord was his refuge. When I was preparing my doctoral dissertation at the University of Strasbourg, France, I was impressed by the statements of a friend who was also working on his dissertation. He said that in the old worship, the Israelites could not come near God. They had to stop at different levels. Women and children could not go beyond the outer court. Men could approach God somewhat nearer as far as the outer altar. But in, in the inner rooms of the temple, men and women were forbidden to enter. Only the priest could enter the holy place, and only the high priest could go to the most holy place. But now, in my friend's view, we all may go directly to the most holy place of the heavenly temple. I found in my research that this erroneous deduction is supported by most of the commentaries on the epistle to the Hebrews. It is evident that in general, modern commentaries do not understand the nature of human approach in the old worship. This is the reason why I believe it, it is necessary to direct our attention to another Hebrew term, Lifne Yahweh, 
before or in the presence or literally in the face of the eternal. Who might appear in the face of the Lord? The high priest, when he went to the most holy place. But this approach took place only once a year on the Day of Atonement, which represented the Day of Judgment. Said in this prescription, I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat or atonement, atonement cover into the sanctuary behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark. The propitiatory was the Latin translation of the golden cover which was over the Ark of the Covenant. Over that golden cover was invisible the throne of God concealed in a cloud. The glory of God was within the cloud, within the curtain that separated the most holy place from the holy place. Right, the high priest, but only the high priest, and only on the Day of Atonement, could physically appear without a veil in the presence or face of God. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Eternal, Lifne Yahweh. The smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the testimony, so that he will not die, Leviticus 16, verse 13. What, what was the testimony? The Ten Commandments written on the tablets of the testimony. Thus, by mercy, God covered his glory with a cloud, and the high priest added the perfumed smoke up to cover that glory, to avoid looking directly at all the splendor of that glory and die. We go to the holy place and see, however, that the priests who officiated there during the year were also in the face of the Lord, despite the fact that there was a curtain separating both apartments. The law said, he is to dip his finger into the blood of the sacrifice for that special day and sprinkle some of it seven times before the Lord in front of the curtain of the sanctuary, Leviticus 4, 6. They appeared before in the presence in the face of God. The priest shall then put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense that is before the Lord in the tent of meeting, Leviticus 4, 7. Since the veil of the most holy place had a little space open above where the curtains hung, sometimes the glory of God came near the curtain and the priest must go back toward the first veil, the veil of the holy place. What a tremendous privilege it was for the priest to officiate for the people in the very presence of the Lord, even if a veil separated him from the divine glory. How much more of a privilege and how much more impressive, therefore, was the appearance for the high priest in the Most Holy. This expression, Lifne Jave, is also applied to the uh, courtyard of the temple where the people come before the presence of the Lord to offer the sin offerings. And uh, the tent of meeting was a reference to the inner rooms of the temple, most often to the holy place where the priest interceded daily for his people before the Lord. So the assembly met in the courtyard before the tabernacle at the entrance to the inner rooms. Let us read verse 15. The elders of the community are to lay their hands on the bulls, on the bull's head before the Lord, in front of the Lord. And the bull shall be slaughtered before in the face of the Lord. Therefore, it was not necessary to go physically into the most holy place to be in the presence of God. 
the purpose of the building was to allow the people to have an idea of how to come near to God to impress the mind and heart of the Israelites with the presence of God, no matter how near could they might be physically in God's sight. Even outside the courtyard, the people were before the Lord in the presence of the Lord. Judge, Judges 21, verse 2 reports that the people went to the house of God where they sat before God until evening, raising their voices. There was not enough space in the courtyard for all the people. When the people were gathered before the tent of meeting, most of them could not be in the courtyard because the size of the courtyard could not embrace the whole congregation. They were, nevertheless, before the Lord. Although physically being even a great distance from the temple, we find, find that they could also be before the Lord in his presence. God showed his anger for the massacre that Saul had committed on the Gibeonites, and several of his offspring were hung on a mountain before the Lord. David handed them over the Gibeonites, who killed and exposed them on a hill before the Lord, Second Samuel 21, verse 9. The presence of the Lord had to do with a spiritual presence. The psalmist said, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the down, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Psalm 139, verses 7 to 12. In consequence, when the Israelites were far from the temple, they didn't feel that they were forgotten by God. On the contrary, they could look forward toward the place of the sanctuary and feel that through the eyes of faith, they were also in the face of the Lord. King Solomon understood this very well. At the inauguration of his temple in Jerusalem, he prayed, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built? Yet give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. O oh Lord, my God, hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. May your eyes be open toward this temple night and day, this place of which you said, my name shall be there, so that you will hear the prayer your servant prays toward this place. First Kings 8, verses 27 to 29. For the Israelites, the fact was that their God was God not only in heaven, but also here on earth. Ellen G. White wrote in her book Education, page 132, the greatness of God is to us incomprehensible. The Lord's throne is in heaven, Psalm 11, verse 4. Yet, by His Spirit, He is everywhere present. Through the Holy Spirit, God can hear. God can watch. God can be everywhere. How that inner connection of Trinity takes place, we don't know. But through the Holy Spirit, God can be in our midst. He has an intimate knowledge of and a personal interest in all the works of his hand. 
when the people speak, we cannot hear them all at once. People say that women can all talk together at the same time and still understand each other. I don't know if this is a special ability or of some ladies or if it is intended as a joke. But no one can receive millions and millions of requests and reply to them at the same time, as if there was no other person in the world to answer. Only God can do this, who controls millions and millions of stars and galaxies and their movements within the universe. The prayer request made to Mary and the presumably saints are a fiction. They don't become gods with the ability to receive the requests of thousands of credulous people. Demons try to deceive us by making many to believe that they are dead human beings. We don't know how many demons are in the world, but probably more than one per person. They constituted a third part of the stars of God according to the Bible. Let us take a look at how personal God is in his dealings with human beings. The Book of Kings has another expression equivalent to Lifne Yahweh. You that did evil in the eyes of the Lord, 1 Kings 14.22. Our life is transparent in the eyes of the Lord. All what we do consciously or not, we do in God's eyes. David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord, 1 Kings 15, verses 4 and 5. How I, how I would decide that after my departure, the court of heaven would say, Alberto did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Asa did what was uh, in 1 Kings 15.11. But sadly, Nadab did evil in the eyes of the Lord. 1 Kings 15.25 and 26. This seems to be an anticipated sentence of the court of heaven in the microcosmos of the ancient people of Israel. Are you afraid of feeling that whatever you do is under the scrutiny of, scrutiny of the, an omniscient God? If you are a converted person, I think you are not afraid of that. On the contrary, converted people feel peace knowing that there is a God who takes care of those who belong to him. There is a Spanish adage which says, the eyes of the master fatten the ox. Children whose fathers look at them with pleasure, though even sometimes with a wise anger, feel more secure in the world. They know that their parents take them into account and take care of them. For this reason, the Lord said through the psalmist, I will teach you. I will make known to you the way in which, in which to go, and I will fix my eyes upon you. Psalm 32, 8. What a wonderful thing is to know that we belong to our Lord, to our Father in heaven, who take care of us. In Psalm 23, verse 6. We may see that our dwelling in the house of God is spiritual. Surely, said David, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Although David did not live in the temple, he knew that, in the, that the doors were always open for him to go there to pray. If not, he knew that he could appear in the temple by faith, just looking toward the place where God dwelt. Psalm 5, verse 7. But I, by your great mercy, will come into your house. In reverence will I bow down toward your holy temple. 
So David didn't have anything to stop him from coming into the presence of the Lord, except if he wanted to go physically into the inner rooms of the sanctuary. He could go within the house of God physically into the courtyard, but only spiritually into the inner rooms. Let us consider now another Old Testament expression, the footstool of the Lord. Solomon explained his purpose for building a place of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 2. The footstool of the Lord was in the most holy place. The throne of God was over the Ark of the Covenant, invisible to human beings, covered by a cloud which also covered the glory of God. That divine glory was called in Hebrew Shekinah. The propitiatory or golden cover of the ark was the place where the divine monarch put his feet. This was his footstool. This is the place, says the Lord, of my throne and the place for the soles of my feet. This is where I will live among the Israelites forever. Ezekiel 43, 7. Let us go call the psalmist to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Psalm 132, verses 7 and 8. The ark of God was for a long time moving to and from different geographical locations without a permanent resting place. The Ark of the Covenant was also separated for a long time from the tent of meeting when the sons of Elijah, the high priest, took it out from the tent to make war against the Philistines. And when the Temple of Solomon was inaugurated, the Ark of the Covenant was brought to its resting place in the most holy place on the Mount of the Lord, where God expected to dwell forever. From that time on, it was expected that the sanctuary would not to wander here and there. The temple of the Lord was now not a tent to be carried from place to place. We will cover these issues more extensively in another subject, in another series of subjects on the sanctuary. Let's go now to the New Testament where we will see similar expressions. Come near to God and he will come near to you. James 4, verse 8. This describes a mutual approach. God came near to the courtyard through his spiritual presence and the people came near to the temple to worship God. This approach to God is today done spiritually. We must come near to God instead of looking permanently toward the things of the earth we have to lift our spiritual eyes toward heaven and then we will see heaven. We will be able to go to the presence of God himself. According to a statement of the spirit of prophecy in the book Education, page 28, while Christ opens heaven to man, the life which he imparts opens the heart of man to heaven. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Psalm 91, verse 5 and 9. When and where did the people worship God? In the courtyard of the temple, looking toward the footstool of the Lord in the most holy place. They couldn't see that footstool because a veil separated it from them. But they knew that the Lord was there, dwelling in his house, and they directed their praises toward his innermost dwelling. They knew that they were there in the face or presence of the Lord, before his eyes, before his footstool. The temple was a place to realize how wonderful the God of Israel really is. One thing I ask of the Lord, 
said uh, <clears throat> David, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Psalm 27, verse 4. For a converted Israelite like David, at his best moments, to go to the temple was the most precious thing he could do. What a privilege to be in the presence of the Lord. He could hear those who were teaching the word of God to inquire on spiritual matters and behold the beauty of the Lord. God told Moses there, above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the air of the testimony, I will meet with you, Exodus 25, verse 22. My name shall be there, hath said the Lord, 1 Kings 8, verse 29. The ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark, 2 Samuel 6, verse 2. How I love the testimony of David recorded, recorded in Psalm 27, verse 4 to 6. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle, sukkah in Hebrew, and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. He will keep me safe. He will hide me. Where? In the most holy place. In the shelter of, the, of his tabernacle. The term employed here is sukkah, an equivalent of Shekinah, which contains the same Hebrew root. This is a reference to the glory of God that was covered by the divine cloud. But David couldn't appear physically in the most holy place. Even so, David couldn't know that this inner room of the sanctuary was safer than any other place. It was from that location that God protected him. David knew that God would set him high upon a rock. He made the plans for the temple that his son Solomon built. The most holy place of that temple was built upon a rock that the Jews today call Sacra. That rock was higher than the holy place. We will see this in another message. So David believed that God would place him there if by faith he sought refuge in the shelter of God's presence. Let us read another equally wonderful statement of faith. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you bestow in the sight of men of those who take refuge in you. In the shelter of your presence, you hide them from the intrigues of men. In your dwelling, sukkah, you keep them safe from the strife of tongues. The Lord preserves the faithful. Psalm 31, verse 19 to 23. Several years ago, I realized that a person was saying bad things about a leader in one of our, our educational institutions in South America. At the moment when we were talking with that leader, I told him what, I, what, was, seen, what was being said on him. He looked at me for a moment and with sad, sad eyes and left. I asked myself, why didn't he defend himself? Why didn't he tell me anything? Several slanders, accusations which could not be proved eventually caused him to live just the same. One year later, everything came to light and he was vindicated. I met him again and I asked him, why didn't you defend yourself? He told me that the more he said, worse it became. 
Few people wanted to believe him. Then he decided to seek refuge in God. And God, at the right time, time vindicated his servant. God may delay the answer, but sooner or later everything comes to light. In the shelter of your presence you hide them from the intrigues of men, from the strife of tongues. Sometimes we think that we have to go out into the street to defend our innocence. And instead of bettering the situation, we only make it worse. The example of Mary is appropriate. She couldn't advocate innocence, telling others that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. She trusted the Lord and waited for his vindication. If we seek the Lord when we are defamed, we will see how safe his shelter is and how wonderful is his peace. How priceless is your unfailing love, said David in Psalm 36, verse 7 and 8. Both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. The wings of the cherubim were a figurative extension, figurative extension of God who dwelled spiritually in them. Those cherubim were over the golden cover of the ark. There is a song that represents this and says. Under his wings I am safely abiding, though the night deepens and tempests are wild. Still I can trust him, I know he will keep me. He has redeemed me and I am his child. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Under his wings, what a refuge in sorrow, how the heart yearningly turns to his rest. Often when earth has no balm for my healing, there I find comfort and there I am blessed. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Under his wings, oh, what precious enjoyment! There will I hide till life's trials are over. Shelter protected, no evil can harm me. Resting in Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Wonderful! We can find refuge under the wings of the omnipotent God. The angels the ancients, who looked by faith to the innermost dwelling of the temple, already experienced that refuge, that spiritual peace. Dear friend, are you feeling alone, abandoned by others, mistreated by those whom you trusted? This world is not worthy of an honest life. 
Everything is unsettled. We may find, find moments of joy and happiness, but there are always setbacks in life. If you are being tried, if you are passing through a period of discouragement and depression, you have to know that there is a God in heaven who wants to protect you in his shelter under the wings of the cherubim, like the springs like, like the spring chickens who hide under the wings of their mother. The Lord does not despise those who come to him in faith. In his youth, when Isaiah wanted to shun the divine call to be a prophet, he went in desperation to the temple. And through that earthly temple, he was taken in vision into the inner places of the heavenly temple. The Shekinah, the visible pavilion of Jehovah, in the Holy of Holies over the mercy seat, was revealed to Isaiah according to the commentary of the spirit of prophecy. What does God do when he comes near his presence? He answers this in Leviticus 10 verse 3. Among those who approach me, I will show myself holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. Leviticus 10, verse 3. When a leper was healed in Israel and came into the presence of the Lord, the priest who officiated the ritual of purification to cleanse the leper had to present both the one to be cleansed and his suffering before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meetings. Meeting, Leviticus 14, 11. How can we come to the Lord for help to be rid of sin? The law, the law said, when anyone is guilty, he must confess what he has sinned and bring his guilt to the eternal for his sin he committed. This is a literal translation that is a female lamb or God from the flock as sin, Leviticus 5, verse 5 and 6. They had to go to the temple with a substitute animal which would die in their place. The prophet Micah emphasized the true spirit required to come into the presence of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Today, something they need to go the top of a hill somewhere and bow before a sculpture. No, we have to go directly to God to find our refuge in the name of Jesus. With what? With a changed heart. In Micah's word, he was showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Micah 6, verse 6 and 8. Because in another text, God says that he resists the proud. In Psalm 61, the psalmist expresses his conviction that he could live in the presence of God even if he is at the ends of the earth. From the ends of the earth I call to you. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. His testimony is the testimony of a converted person, because he says, I long to dwell in your tent, O hell, in Hebrew, forever, and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. The shelter of God is a spiritual shelter, an invisible hedge, as shown in the case of Job, which protects God's people. That hedge is often invisible to man, but absolutely visible for evil hosts. Because the angel of the Lord comes around those who fear the Lord and defends them. Do you remember this psalm of David? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He will cover you with his feather, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. 
Let's seek the same message in the words of the apostles in the New Testament. In the epistle to the Hebrews, Paul wrote, we have confidence to enter the sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary, by the blood of Jesus, Hebrews 10, verse 19. We can enter the temple in heaven. It is true that we cannot enter physically within the temple, like the Israelites couldn't go physically into the inner rooms of the sanctuary. But our entrance is spiritual. We enter there by faith. We have confidence. We have faith to enter the heavenly temple through our prayers because without faith it is impossible to please God. We ha have confidence to enter that temple by the blood of Jesus. We don't need to bring an animal to be sacrificed because the blood of Jesus has already been shed now once forever. The only thing we have to do is to come to the Lord, to Jesus, who has a permanent priesthood. Jesus has a permanent priesthood, said the, the Lord in Hebrews 7, verse 24 and 25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. We will never find him sleeping, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. 1 Peter 3, verse 12. Jesus has a permanent service in the house of his Father. As we have already seen, he is our infallible advocate, because he never loses a case. He requires us to repent, to confess our sins, so that he may grant us his spirit transform our lives completely. Romans chapter 5, verse 2. Through whom Jesus, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And uh, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 2 how many passages of the Bible we can find to assure us in full certainty that the promised promises of God are real and that heaven is our safest, safest place for refuge. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse, eight, verse 18, we read, For through him we, both Gentiles or pagans who convert to Jesus and Jews who convert also to the Lord, have access to the Father by one Spirit. There is an access, a bridge to the presence of God. This access is performed by the Holy Spirit, and God doesn't arbitrarily withdraw His Spirit only under persistent rejection will He leave us with pain in His heart because He respects our free will. In Him and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Yes, of course, we may enter the presence of God, but let us not say that the ancient could not. They could also approach the presence of God through faith in the future sacrifice of the Lamb of God that was represented in the old animal sacrifices. Hebrews 4, verse 16. This is a call for you, dear friend, who are watching this program. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When I was uh, nine years old, uh, and uh, I had to pass through a... Uh, uh, in my primary school, to a place where there was a boy a little uh, higher than me. So I'd, I had to walk 20 blocks from my home, and I had to cross an avenue and pass through a train station. Another boy used to hang out with his friends not far from the railroad. He would provoke me nearly every day 
laughing at me because I was younger than him. One day I told my little brother who was seven years old to continue walking home as we approached that boy. He provoked me again and uh, I punched him suddenly in the face and started to run toward the train station. Once on the platform of the train, which at that time had free access, my persecutor was catching up with me. I saw a young man walking and I threw myself in his arms yelling, Sir, help me, protect me from that boy who wants to hit me. That yo the young man took the other boy with his hands while I started to run again, now in the direction of my home. Hold him a little longer, I yelled. No, he punched me first, said my adversary. The young man looked at me and laughing asked me two or three times, do you want me to release him? Not yet, I replied. Fortunately for me, my opponent was released when I was too far for him to reach me. I met my little brother some blocks farther. I arrived safely, safely at home. How often we need protection. What a good thing it is to find someone to help us. We count on someone who received all power in heaven as well as on the earth. He is our safe refuge. In his name, we will be saved. While living in California, one day I received a local phone call which caused me great pain and anguish. I went to my bedroom and I prayed greatly concerned. Just before finishing my prayer, a neighbor who had never visited my house before and with whom I had never spoken, knocked at the door. He wasn't aware that he was the answer to my prayer. Sometimes in a moment of discouragement, a phone call from the other extreme end of the country gave me some news that completely changed my outlook. Why should we live alone in this world, thinking that no one cares when we have such a wonderful Lord in heaven who watches over us. When we can find a safe refuge in the very presence of God, God doesn't want us to live in fear. He knows our need, needs. Trust Him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Hebrews 11, verse 6. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched. You have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 and 22. Already the ancients could come near by faith to the future events like the court of heaven. They could approach the very heavenly realities by faith. Still more today, it is our privilege to come near to the throne of God in the heavenly intercession. You have, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, persists the apostle. To the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Dear friend, you must know, like we know by our own experience, that God answers our prayers, that he exists, that Jesus intercedes for us, and that in his name there is power, liberation, and access to God. Hebrews 10, verse 19 uh, to 22 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by a new 
and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Let us go, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Well, we may go to the presence of God through the blood of Jesus, through the curtain, that is, through the body of Jesus, which corresponds to the, his human body, who was glorified and is uh, before the presence of God. Yes, we are expected to be sincere. We are required to have the certainty of our faith. If we are sincere, if we are honest, if we strip our soul before our Creator and Redeemer and confess honestly our faults to God and ask Him to intervene in our lives to be transformed to the image of His Son, we will overcome and find that needed refuge. The apostle continues by saying, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, a reference to baptism. Baptism is a public testimony of faith, which is performed on persons who have reached the age where they can use their reason. God requires us to be baptized as a testimony that we accept him as our father and that he adopts us as his children. Now I call you again for the last time in this message. Come to your safe refuge. Come to the word of God, to the church of the Lord. Come to the presence of God in a communion that will grant peace and happiness. I know that from the bottom of your heart, you want to open your soul to God. Therefore, I invite you to kneel before the Lord to invoke His presence in our lives. Our precious Heavenly Father, we come to you, to your innermost place, to your presence, to the presence of the angels of God who praise your name. We come to you by faith, to our safe refuge, because you protect through the ministry of your angels everyone who comes to you. We accept you as our Father. We accept Jesus as our Savior, as our High Priest, as the one who intercedes for us. Give us peace, give us protection, and give us the joy to walk in this life in your presence, in that spiritual presence, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.